Hello again, my name is uh, Dr. Reggie Vanderveen. I'm a uh, Transitions Consultant with Henry Schein Professional Practice Transitions. Um, thank you for uh, uh, viewing this video today and i also like to thank the uh, Michigan Dental Association. Uh, no, another wonderful uh, uh, member benefit uh, that you have uh, by being a member of the MDA. So thank you very much for uh, allowing me to be here. Uh, what we'll be talking about today are the steps that uh, are necessary when you're buying an existing practice. Uh, but before we get into uh, the actual steps, uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, why you would want to even buy a uh, dental practice that's uh, up and running uh, in the first place. And the biggest number one reason as to why you want to go ahead and purchase an existing practice is to have access to a, a wonderful patient base. Uh, that's the number one reason because when we really look at it uh, most of our uh, graduates of dental schools these days are uh, facing a crushing amount of uh, debt uh, and that debt load has to be serviced properly and the best way to do that in most instances is to find a practice that has a solid patient base. Uh, the other thing that you get when you buy an existing practice is the immediate endorsement of the uh, practicing dentist. So the transfer of that uh, patient base, that goodwill if you will, uh, goes ahead and gets transferred to you right away so that you can go ahead and get that jump start on the career that you so desperately need. Uh, the other uh, things of uh, uh, the advantages to buying an existing practice, 80% uh, of those new patients uh, um, that are going to come out of that practice are going to be generated by that uh, existing patient base. Uh, let me just look here and a couple other notes here that I need to, to mention before we get into the actual steps. You're going to get a competent and trained staff. You're not going to have any issues at all as far as trying to bring in a brand new staff, train them all, and do the things that are necessary to become a successful practitioner. That base is right there. You're going to find business systems that are in place so that you don't have to recreate the wheel. If you've got a successful practice in place, with those patients comes the business systems that are necessary to become a good businesswoman or businessman in the state of Michigan. The other thing that you have to understand is the fact that location, location, location is about the most important thing when it comes to a practice. Rather than hanging up your shingle and starting on your own, if you've got a location where patients are comfortable coming into, um, you can't put a price tag on that an awful lot. But we'll get to that in a minute. One of the other reasons that uh, uh, people choose a location uh, is because where their family is. So that's a big question that you have to ask yourself before you go ahead and decide on a location or a practice. You have to find out whether or not that's the right area for you to bring up your family. And there are a lot of opportunities out there that people don't look at because they're a little bit farther uh, away from their uh, geographic center, if you will. Uh, but if you're willing to drive a little bit and maybe look at a rural practice as opposed to one that's uh, uh, based in an urban area, um, you just have to look at those things because, quite frankly, there are some extremely successful practices out there that are going to make you an extremely successful businessman or businesswoman when it really comes down to practicing dentistry. And there are a couple other approaches that you might want to consider too before you choose a location. Uh, one of the things that we suggest that uh, um, recent graduates do is uh, look at the uh, um, uh, dentists that are practicing in the locale that you're interested in going into and contacting them. There's nothing wrong with that. In fact, we really encourage that. Do your due diligence and find out what kind of practitioners are around the geographic area in which you want to settle. The other thing that you can do is uh, consult with the uh, dental supply houses. Or you can look to someone that's a, a transitions consultant uh, or talk to a broker that has practices listed in the area in which you uh, want to settle. One of the other preliminary steps that you have to uh, consider making is uh, choosing your advisors. Uh, there are transitions consultants out there that you can pick from. There are brokers that have uh, practices listed. Uh, that's sometimes the best way to go about finding the uh, proper practice for you. Um, and there are some um, uh, brokers out there. Um, most of them, as a matter of fact, uh, have a thing called dual agency. They'll represent both the buyer and the seller. 
It's not quite like buying a house sometimes where you'll have a, a, a buying agent and a selling agent and they'll try to work together to sell the house. Many times what you'll find is that there's a transitions consultant or a broker out there uh, that can represent both sides. It's not like buying a house, but it is sort of like buying a house. You can do your due diligence with an independent third party if you choose the right individuals. You also have to look at uh, picking up the uh, services of an attorney because most of the contracts are going to be out of your wheelhouse, your comfort zone, as far as trying to figure out whether or not uh, those contracts make sense to you. So we suggest that you get an attorney involved in the process, not right at the beginning usually because that's not necessary, but when you get down to looking at some of the, uh, um, uh, the contracts and a lot of the paperwork that needs to be looked at, you need to have competent help to review, not so much rewrite, or try to redo and restructure the deal for you, but you need someone to look at those things independently so that you know what's going on. You'll also have to have a CPA or an accountant to help you out a little bit to make sure that you can get through all the uh, information that you're going to have about a practice. So if you have a CPA or some sort of accountant that has a background in uh, health care, uh, and specifically in dentistry, uh, that's also another advisor that you might want to seek help with. Now, the first step that you'll have to go ahead and start to uh, uh, take is um, getting through a practice analysis. And um, one of the most important aspects of this is to make sure that uh, uh, before you're given any of this information, um, you have to have a, a non-disclosure agreement in place uh, so that it can protect the uh, confidential information that you're going to be receiving uh, on these dental practices that you're going to be evaluating. So don't be afraid of uh, signing a non-disclosure agreement. It's just a good way to protect you and protect the uh, uh, seller's interest as far as confidentiality is concerned. So that'll be probably the first step that you'll be asked to take. Uh, the other thing that you'll uh, have to uh, start to worry about um, uh, reviewing uh, is evaluation. And let's take two seconds right now about an evaluation or a practice uh, appraisal. Um, if a practice appraisal is done properly, it's done according to generally accepted accounting principles, uh, make sure that the valuation has been done by a professional that understands that a transition consultant, a CPA, uh, they usually have uh, uh, the best interest of the seller at heart, first and foremost. But if it's done properly, you will certainly ascertain the fair market value of the practice if it's done according to um, generally accepted accounting principles. And the valuation looks at the, uh, the net profit of the practice. In other words, you have to make sure that the practice is going to be able to support the debt that you're going to have to take on in order to purchase this practice. So valuations are a very essential part of the whole process. And if you've ever seen uh, advertisements for people trying to sell their practices, uh, brokers sometimes say they, gave, they give valuations away for free. Um, sometimes a free valuation probably isn't going to be in your best interest, the buyer. So make sure that it's done properly and trust the individuals that go ahead and do it. Make sure that you can trust them so that the valuation is truly a fair market value of what the practice is. Another part of that initial step process of looking at an appraisal is to find out whether or not the retiring dentist uh, needs to stay on in order to protect that, uh, uh, that investment that you're going to be making. There are an awful lot of sales because of the uh, facilities that are involved. There are a lot of sales where it's called a walk-away type of uh, purchase. That's where the retiring dentist doesn't stay on. But don't be afraid about those types of arrangements because quite frankly, in some cases, when someone's only going to be staying there less than a year, that's probably the best way to go. Remember, it's the endorsement from the retiring dentist that's going to protect the goodwill that you're going to be purchasing. And the goodwill is going to make up the lion's share of any valuation. Another thing you'll see in the valuation is what the asking price is going to be on the practice. That may not be the same as the valuation, but it should be within a, uh, a close range of what uh, uh, the valuation says the practice is worth. You're going to find out what the gross receipts are, what the adjusted net income is, and things like that in evaluation to make sure that it's uh, uh, done properly. Have someone review that with you if you're uncomfortable doing so. 
And the second step that you'll be taking, and this is if the initial um, review process is positive, in other words, if you think this is the right practice for you, uh, you'll be asked to uh, visit with the seller, and that'll be a very important time for you to be able to determine whether or not that seller is going to be a good mix for you. Uh, the chance for you to be able to visit right on site uh, depends on the confidentiality of the situation, uh, but hopefully you'll be able to get into uh, the practice and see what's going on. Uh, you might not be able to do that with staff around and certainly might not be able to do that with patients present, but you should be able to get in there if you feel as though your initial process is working well with that dentist so that you can take the final steps that are necessary in purchasing a practice. After you've had a chance to uh, confirm the initial uh, positive influence that this practice has had on you, uh, then you can get in there and dig a little deeper and find out what some of the weaknesses are. That will help you out in the whole due diligence process as you go through this thing. Uh, the other thing that you're going to find out is that uh, uh, the biggest number in any practice sometimes isn't so much what the purchase price is, but what the active patient count is, con is, is concerned. Uh, with. So in other words, that active patient count, you have to be really concerned about making sure that it's true. You're going to go into practices and you're going to see great big huge uh, walls full of charts, but you're going to have to figure out how many of those patient charts are actually indicative of uh, active patients. And by an active patient, what we do is try to define that as a patient who's been seen at least one time in an 18-month period of time. So one time in 18 months is an active patient. Uh, and uh, that number is the crucial number that you're going to need to uh, ascertain uh, before you go ahead and make any offer on any practice. In fact, you might even want to uh, go ahead and refer to a, a video I did earlier on associateships. Uh, we talk an awful lot about numbers because that's the bottom line when it really comes to looking at the valuation of a practice how many active patients there actually are. The next thing that you'll be looking at as far as the physical layout of the uh, practice is concerned, you have to determine whether or not that uh, particular uh, facility is going to be able to support your production in there, especially if you've got the uh, retiring dentist that plans on staying along for a, a certain period of time. Sometimes uh, you have a uh, scheduled transition that takes a year or two for that retiring dentist to get out. Uh, of uh, active practice. And if that's the case, you have to make a decision as to whether or not that facility is going to uh, support the uh, placement of uh, two dentists at the same time. You also want to make sure, like I said earlier, 80% of all your new patients are going to come from that existing patient base. And is there support for that? You have to make sure that those patient numbers are true and accurate so that that new patient flow can take care of the things that are necessary as you grow as a practitioner. And another thing that you'll see as you go into a practice is whether or not the practice is being, quote, taken care of. Uh, if you see as though, uh, or if you feel as though that the facility is being kind of let slide a little bit, uh, that should uh, give you a little bit of concern because you're going to have to spend some big money on upgrades and things like that in order to make it right for you digital x-rays, all those things that uh, uh, new practitioners really look at. Make sure that uh, the facility can support that sort of uh, thing for you. Your next step is to uh, get involved with the interviewing side of things as far as the seller is concerned. One of the things that you probably want to determine right up front is whether or not your personalities are close enough in order for this uh, transition to work properly. Are they too close, They're too far apart? You have to make a decision, and you can learn that as you interview uh, with the uh, as you interview the uh, uh, selling dentist. And unlike the purchase of a house, um, you're going to find out that, uh, who that seller is and what that seller is all about. Um, that doesn't happen when you're buying a house, but it certainly has to happen when you're transitioning into a practice. And because of the uh, fact that you're interviewing a, a seller. Um, dual agency sometimes is a very common element in this whole process. Uh, you also want to find out through the uh, retiring dentist what the dental service mix is. Uh, you're going to be asking questions about managed care, uh, Medicaid practices, uh, find out what the numbers are, and you can do that on a face-to-face -face type of basis with a selling dentist. It's probably the best way to figure out 
where that person is and what kind of production mix that you're looking at in this practice that you're considering to purchase. After these few positive visits with the selling dentist, you're going to look harder at the numbers that are involved in the valuation. You're going to see whether or not uh, there are some numbers that are out of whack. Is the lab bill way too high? Is this a high production um, a restorative type of practice uh, or a prosthetic practice? There may not be an awful lot left for you to do on certain types of uh, uh, practices so that you, you have to really do uh, a good look at what uh, uh, the numbers look like. And this is why a transition consultant or a broker sometimes can be a very, very important uh, element in this whole process. So have someone help you out with the numbers to make sure that what you're buying is what you need to service the debt, take care of your family, make some money, and take good care of those patients that you're spending a lot of money on. You have to understand something about practices that are for sale by existing owners. Uh, if they've been there a long time, this is their baby. They've spent an awful lot of time in that practice. They've created a good will with that patient base. Uh, they have a, a staff that's dedicated to the whole process of taking care of patients. Uh, so there's not only a logical element to selling a practice, there's a very, very large emotional uh, component to this whole sale process too. So realize that when you're getting close to making an offer on the practice. The biggest hurdle to get over is the asking price. Once you've determined what the asking price is and you've done some of your initial um, due diligence in the process and are comfortable with that, if you can agree upon a purchase price for the practice, 95% of the time, all the other steps that are necessary to complete this transaction uh, take place without too much uh, problem. So the number one issue is selling price, and then the other 200 things that we have to get through usually just fall into place without too much trouble at all. So don't be too um, concerned about all the little steps that are necessary take care of the big one which is to agree upon the purchase price and you'll see how easy this process can go after that. An offer on a dental practice is made through a formal instrument called an offer to purchase. That sets the purchase price of the practice and there are additional provisions within that offer to purchase that allow you to continue your due diligence of the practice and it also allows you a chance to be able to have enough time to get financing for this practice. The other thing that you're going to notice is that um, uh, in, in an offer to purchase that there's going to be a uh, reference uh, to the two parties, the seller and the buyer, uh, to work towards a practice purchase agreement. That's the larger um, step that has to be taken in this whole process and that is to um, determine a practice purchase agreement. And that has all the things that are necessary for a transition to occur. The next step, once an offer to purchase has been made and accepted, uh, we have to get financing for that practice. And I'm going to go ahead and just read a few of the things that are necessary for us to be able to get financing when you're looking at a practice. For the buyer, most lenders will require the last two years tax returns, your licenses, your driver's license, your, your dental license, um, your DEA number, things like that. Uh, and uh, you're going to have to go ahead and complete an application with your lender. Unless you've got private financing for this thing, that's a necessary thing that you have to go through. For the seller, most lenders will require a valu valuation that we talked about. And banks are very good at looking at valuations to make sure that they're done according to uh, generally accepted counting principles. Uh, they need that in order for them to be able to feel secure in giving you a sizable amount of money to purchase this practice. They'll also ask for the tax returns on the practice and on the uh, uh, if it's a sole pri uh, proprietor and they'll also ask for uh, the corporate uh, uh, tax returns too. We'll need profit and loss statements from the uh, seller and we'll also have to have a business plan or a pro forma. Uh, some banks don't need this as much if they feel as though that all the information they've gotten out of a decently done valuation um, gives them enough uh, uh, comfort level for them to be able to provide the loan that you'll need. 
One of the hidden benefits of dealing with an outside lending institution is that they're like an extra set of eyes to look at some of the things that you're uh, uh, looking at uh, as far as whether or not that practice is worth what you're paying. Some sales are seller financed and you lose that independent third party looking at it if you're not using a lending institution. So uh, you're going to have to conduct a little bit more due diligence on that process if the seller's actually holding the note. And if you are using a lending institution, lending institutions before they can go ahead and uh, give the money for the uh, practice purchase, uh, they can uncover um, some hidden liens that you wouldn't normally see if you're going to have a seller finance type of uh, uh, transition. The next step in purchasing a practice is to put together a practice purchase agreement. This is a very lengthy document. It's fairly simple, but it's a lengthy document that lists all the things that are necessary to purchase a practice. One of the biggest parts of that is the warranties and responsibilities of each party, and that's a long and lengthy aspect of the practice purchase agreement, but it's a necessary one if a lending institution is getting involved in it. In fact, it's a good idea to have in every contract that you have. Make sure everything that you need is in writing. And that's when you get involved with attorneys. Now, if you've made the deal and you're comfortable with the deal and you're moving on down the road, it shouldn't be necessary for an attorney or attorneys to go ahead and rewrite the entire document, especially if you're having this document, this practice purchase agreement, put together uh, by an independent third party like a transitions consultant, like a broker. So that aspect of it is taken care of. So you don't need to get your attorneys involved to do any of the negotiation at that moment in time. As I said, if you can agree upon a purchase price for the practice, 95% of all the other things that uh, uh, will happen will happen correctly. So in other words, your chance of having a sale are very good. And one of the final steps that you'll be making in a practice purchase are taking care of all the remaining details. And I can't go to, into each one of them right here because there are literally dozens and dozens and dozens of them, but let me just go ahead and list just a few just so that you know what the whole process is about. First thing that you'll have to be determining is whether or not you need a lease. Most lending institutions will not give you a loan unless you have a lease in place that is equal to or longer than what the terms are on the note. The next thing that you'll need is to get all the insurances that are uh, necessary by lenders. And this is just common sense stuff that we should be doing anyway. You have to have disability insurance, you have to have your malpractice insurance, you'll have to have your property and casualty insurances all in place. Those are some of the things that are necessary. If you're going to be a corporate uh, entity, you'll need to have a tax ID number, or if you're a social proprietor, all you need is your social security number. Uh, you'll need a business checking account. You're going to have to transfer uh, all the insurances that uh, you have uh, contracts with with the existing uh, dentist. In other words, you'll need uh, a contract with Delta, Blue Cross, Blue Shield, Medicaid, and those types of things. Uh, you're going to have to formulate a patient letter. Remember, the endorsement by the doctor that's selling the practice to you is one of the most important aspects of protecting the goodwill of this practice. So you'll have a chance to review that letter and make sure that it introduces you properly and it also allows the seller to be able to thank his patients for all those years of wonderful uh, care that uh, he's been allowed to give them. You'll have to have stationery, uh, business cards, all those things need to be taken care of. And most transition consultants have a list that's uh, readily available so that you can check things off as you go through the whole process. That's a very big important aspect that you can find uh, readily available through a broker or transitions consultant. If not, those things have to be done properly if you're going to make this transition work properly. And the final step that we take in a practice transition, a practice purchase, is the closing. The closing is usually just for logistical reasons only. You may have a seller that's uh, out of state. Um, a lot of times you'll have a lending institution that's a national lending institution, so we have to have a, uh, a formal closing on the sale of the practice. And this is the time 
that uh, we can introduce the buyer uh, to the seller staff. Many times confidentiality is a huge issue and there are buyers out there that have to be introduced after closing uh, to the staff. So more often than not, don't be uh, put off by that aspect at all. That's a very normal type of uh, situation that we run into when we're selling a practice. So at the closing, the introduction of the uh, buyer to the seller staff occurs, and that's when the announcement letter that we took uh, great pains to produce uh, goes out to the patient base. So the closing, that's it. It's time for you to go ahead and chill that champagne and get ready to start your new career uh, in someone's practice that they're turning over to you. It's your job to go ahead and protect that goodwill, take care of those patients, and you'll be a success. Thank you for this time.